I'm Linda Bell, I'm Provost and Dean of the Faculty, and on behalf of Barnard College, I'm pleased to welcome you. Tonight we'll discuss biology and sexual selection with Rebecca Jordan-Young, Associate Professor of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies, and with Allison Pisqueda, Assistant Professor of Biology. Professor Jordan-Young is an Associate Professor of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. She works at the intersection of scientific practice and its theoretical underpinnings as they are affected by race, by gender, by sexuality, and class, and interrogates the process by which we produce scientific knowledge. Supported by the National Institute of Health, the National Science Foundation, and others, she's conducted research on HIV AIDS, substance use and treatment, and urban epidemiology. She is the recipient of a number of honors and awards, most recently including fellowships from the American Council of Learned Societies and the Guggenheim Foundation. Allison Pesquetta joined the Barnard faculty in 2017, and her work takes advantage of the promiscuous fruit fly mating system to study sexual selection and sexual conflict, drawing from the fields of animal, animal behavior, evolutionary biology, and genetics. She's published articles on male mate choice and on the cost of sexual attractiveness to female fruit flies, and is currently working on two manuscripts for publication. She has twice been named a Kavli Fellow by the US National Academy of Sciences, an honor awarded to young scientists who have made significant contributions to their research field. While they both work in very different disciplines, and with very diverse approaches. Both Professor Jordan Young and Professor Pisqueta examine the effects of sex and gender and aim to strip back preconceptions about biology and about sex. So to begin our discussion this evening, I'm gonna to turn to you, Professor Jordan Young. Let's, um, let's begin with the philosophy or theory that's grounded your work. You've criticized the International Association of Athletic Fe Federation's sex testing of testosterone levels in female athletes for its lack of firm evidence and discrimination against women of color and intersex athletes. You've made the similar criticism of the International Olympic Committee. Can you tell us how your scientific research has led you to make these um, strong statements? Yes, thank you. From the very beginning of modern elite sport, if you took uh, the, the resurrection of the Olympics uh, as a competition in the early 20th century, elite women athletes have faced a conundrum, which is that sport is culturally designated as a masculine pursuit and is something that males do and males excel at. So while women com competitors were clamoring to compete and be included, they also, from the very beginning, faced the problem that truly excellent, outstanding athletes were uh, routinely seen as masculine and were suspected of being actually male. And this is a fantastically interesting place where um, the complexity of the biology of sex came up against social expectations that sex is something that is simple and straightforward and surely we could just sort the men from the women and know who's who and, and together with, with that al already uh, sticky paradox that actually sex is not simple and straightforward, throw into that um, nationalist preoccupations with other countries cheating in order to get more medals, um, racial ideologies that position some women as just naturally closer to the pinnacle of femininity and other women as more suspicious in terms of maybe being masculine or male. And throughout the 20th century, been, there were many, many different kinds of attempts to come to some kind of firm scientific way of sorting out. So in late 2011, a colleague uh, approached me and told me about this new rule on testosterone. And immediately, based on some of the claims being made about testosterone, I knew that I didn't know the specific evidence around sports yet, but I knew enough to be suspicious of the grand claims that were getting made. And I 
agreed to be part of this research team, and it really just took off from there. What do I mean when I say that the biology of sex is complex? Um, in human beings, there is no definitive biological characteristic that can sort males from females. And they're, they're, it's always subjective which characteristic or group of characteristics you choose. And there's usually some purpose in mind. So if you want to know something about reproduction, it would make sense to sort people according to whether they make eggs versus make sperm. But lots of people don't make either. A very, very, very vanishingly tiny proportion of people make both. But it's not a very good basis on which to decide because many, many people functionally in the world don't actually either make you know, sperm or eggs, or it's just not functionally the thing. So people think about chromosomes, you know, the so-called sex chromosomes, XX, XY, but it turns out that is not a good dividing line either. Um, and uh, so without going into all the different ways that, that sports organizations have tried to split it, um, for a while they just called a moratorium on sex testing and said, we're going to go with the legal and social presentation of the athletes who arrive. And then there were some controversies, and they tried to revive it with testosterone under the claims that, first of all, testosterone is uh, sex dimorphic, that it is the main ingredient in male typical athletic advantage, um, and a variety of other claims. But just on those two, the more research that I've done, the more interesting and complicated it gets, starting with the idea that testosterone is sex dimorphic in humans. The group that I work with published a piece in Science a few years back challenging that particular claim. It's actually um, a contentious claim, and it depends on how you decide who goes in the category of male and female in the first place. And as far as the idea that testosterone is the main thing that fuels athletic success, that has turned out to be a fantastic uh, line of inquiry. Mm -hmm. and, it, and one of the things that really surprised me from pretty early on is how little actual firm evidence there is. And the most recent studies that are claimed as really answering turn out to not be independent research, but they're studies that have been done by the same people who wrote the rules. And most recently, um, a group of scientists has called for retraction of the paper that was seen as the most crucial paper for um, giving firm evidence for the latest IAAF rule. So there's lots more to say, but that's, that gives just, you insight. Just one quick follow-up question. How mm -hmm. varied were the researchers in your team in terms oh, of discipline? And good question. So uh, over time, I worked with a bunch of different people. Um, the main person I worked with from the beginning was a cultural anthropologist. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Katrina Carcasis, she and I just completed uh, a manuscript on testosterone that we decided we wanted to do a whole book on tea, not just on sports. So keep your eyes out for testosterone, an unauthorized biography. Um, <laughs> and uh, we also worked early on when we published our first paper, we got contacted by this uh, eminent endocrinologist in the UK who used to be on the International Olympic Committee's Medical Commission, and he said, "You know, you're really on to something here. Can I help you?" And he and we worked with a bunch of data. We worked with um, a geneticist. Uh, we've worked with sports scientists. We ended up working with a lot of folks in sports physiology, uh, and it, we've the, the team has has shifted depending on what we're writing and what's the particular project. Very interesting. So, turning to you, Professor Pasqueda. Um, can you tell us first about your research? Just give us an, a sense of, of how you conduct your research and the vastness of your research. But then, um, how does your data on fr fruit fly sexual selection sort of challenge popular notions about monogamy and promiscuity? As you've mentioned a couple of times, I work with fruit flies, which most people think of as, if they think of them at all, as a common household pest. <laughs> Um, but part of the reason that I work with them is that they do have this promiscuous mating system where males and females both mate with multiple individuals. Um, and the reason that this is so interesting is that if you talk to people about 
you know, what they know about animals' sex lives, which um, is something I talk to people about a lot. <laughs> um, a, a lot of people sort of have this ingrained idea that there's a lot of monogamy in the animal kingdom, that you know, you sort of watch nature documentaries and it's all about finding a partner and, oh, he finds his mate and then it's a happily ever after kind of story and that's not really an honest depiction of sex in the animal kingdom. Um, and I think it's really interesting because it took probably about a century of studying <laughs> sexual selection, which is how the sexes find a partner and choose who to mate with. And it took probably about a century um, that we were studying sexual selection before scientists began to realize that females might not be these chaste caregivers that was sort of the way that they had been viewed. And in the early 1980s, we developed DNA fingerprinting technology that allowed researchers to do paternity analysis. And there's a series of just wonderful studies out of um, what were previously thought of as monogamous songbirds. Mm -hmm. And the birds are wonderful examples because um, the, you know, a male and a female partner up and they build a nest together and they take turns caring for their offspring and it's this, this beautiful family with a, a lovely partnership between the males and females. And once the technology to do paternity analysis came along, they went in and looked at these nests and regularly there were offspring in the nest fathered by somebody other than the dad who was taking care of them and routinely fathered by multiple males. So unbeknownst to the scientists and the bird watchers, when they weren't watching these individuals, they were mating with other, <laughs> other individuals. <laughs> and this is something that really um, revolutionized the way that we think about the way that the sex is interacted because you used to have this idea of, okay, the, the female will meet with the male and then her next job is to care for the offspring. And that was sort of the role that the female had and depending on the species, the male would either help to care for the offspring or go look for another mate. And then scientists began to realize that females were actually engaging in just as much promiscuity as the males were. And that's what really um, leads me to my research program because just like the, the monogamous birds, the, the fruit flies are quite promiscuous and they mate with a lot of individuals. And this creates sort of two real, real consequences for how males and females interact. The first is that normally when you think of sexual selection, you think of birds of paradise, they have this really beautiful plumage. The males are brightly colored, they have elaborate feathers, and they perform these beautiful dances and sing to try and attract a mate. Or you think of um, you know, elk in the forest fighting one another with their, their antlers to, for dominance and, and to gain access to females. And that's what we usually think of. But when a female is not monogamous, the male who successfully wins a female and is able to mate with her isn't guaranteed to father all of her offspring because that female could go and mate with another male. So it's interesting, and this is one of the components of my research, is that we now know that sexual selection can act sort of leading up to acquiring a mate. So these males can compete for females, females can be choosy, these kind of traditional ideas exist, but then because females can mate multiple times, you end up with selection continuing after mating where females can routinely have sperm from multiple males inside their reproductive tract at a time. So you end up with these sperm competing for fertilization, for eggs, and females in many species having some degree of control over the sperm that they use. And part of the reason that I work in fruit flies to answer these questions is that they are promiscuous, males and females mate a lot. The females have a remarkable capacity to store sperm. So a female can store sperm from a single mating for as long as three months but they mate on average once a day. So you have the potential for multiple male, the sperm from multiple males to be competing to fertilize the female's eggs. And that's sort of one of the, the directions that I take my research is understanding uh, the behavioral and the um, sort of evolutionary consequences of multiple mating in females. Hmm. Really, for both of you, can, can sex similarities and differences or sexual selection differences, in what extent, to what extent are they affected by biological functions or, or you know, in your research by um, secreted pheromones or things like that? You know, echoing what you were saying earlier about um, differences between the sexes, I mean, I, you know, I work with fruit flies that I primarily identify on the basis of their genitalia. That's how I identify a male and a female. It's um, the only metric that I can use to categorize them on the basis of their sex. And there are definite, definite differences between um, the two sexes. There are 
a subset of behaviors that are largely only performed by males. So males perform um, a courtship song to try and woo a female. And we, I have never in over a decade of working with fruit flies seen any females perform this song. But if you modify their nervous system slightly and change the way that a specific function, a specific cluster of neurons functions, you can actually mm -hmm. genetically engineer females that are able to court. They have the physical capability of doing it, they just don't regularly do it. So even though I've never seen a female that's had this mutation in nature that makes her able to perform these male's behaviors, that doesn't mean it's not an entire possibility. And I think one of the things that's so interesting is that when we talk about the differences between the sexes, I mean, we're largely talking about averages. You see, on average, that males look or act, that, you know, here, and on average, females look and act this way, but there's so much variation around those means, and it's very difficult to find in fruit flies even a trait that's completely different in males and completely different in females. There's always some overlap between the two sexes. So picking that up with humans, the, the concept of overlap is one that, um, that I emphasize a lot in work that I do. I think about a, um, a group of um, cognitive scientists and neuroscientists that I worked with um, to write a couple of pieces a few years ago where we talked about um, just trying to simplify a number of principles in thinking about how do you approach sex and gender in neuroscience. And one of the main things that we emphasized early on was precisely the principle of overlap and the, the the way that we talk about similarity or difference and the way that we focus on that is, in humans, of course, very, very consequential. So thinking of something as a male trait or a male behavior or a female trait or a female uh, behavior affects the way we perceive people in our world, the way we think about ourselves, the way we uh, relate to each other, and so on. And it's important to recognize that those expectations and what we measure, what we know empirically about the shape of similarity or difference varies enormously across time periods, across populations. They, it depends on the class of the group, the ethnicity, the national origin, all kinds of things, and the averages. And then there's variation within. So one, another principle along with overlap is to recognize that there is more variation within either sex than there is variation between the sexes. It's not exactly the question you asked, because I think you're asking about where do the, the differences in particular that we see actually come from? And that leads to another concept that um, I work with, and an increasing number of biologists and natural scientists of a variety of sort are trying to figure out how to work with this same concept, and that is to, instead of separating out sex as in biology, what is male and female, and gender as in the social world of masculinity and femininity that operates on all these levels, to recognize that we can conceptually separate those two things, but in particular in human beings, we do not have any um, way at this point in time methodologically of mechanistically separating them to understand what contributes to development. Because development always happens within a particular environment and a particular context. So when you hear somebody say X behavior is something percent you know, genetic or biological, that's already wrong. Because you can't separate out um, the context ever. And we had a great conversation the other day about how you can have really great, important, meaningful experiments that contribute to the expansion of knowledge that are valid experiments. And then you change the circumstances, you change the context of the lab or something about the environment of of the fruit flies or whoever it is that you're observing, and the relationships that you see change. And that's something that we know across many, many species for, for many aspects of biology that show reliable sex differences. So whether you're talking about how much you know the particular um, dendritic development on a set of neurons is different 
between males and females, or you're talking about weight differences between males and females, the context in which the animals develop and the animals are observed matters. So to me, what, what I'm most interested in is trying to take these philosophical and conceptual understandings and then work with scientists who are doing empirical work and say, what could you do mechanistically to try to see um, how that changes the way you would do an experiment or informs how you might interpret your findings? You want to answer that question? <laughs> what would you do? Oh, well, I mean, it's, it is a strength of working in a lab that you can test in a variety of environments. You can manipulate mm -hmm. this and look to see if the patterns that you're observing in one environment hold when you change them. So it, right. it's a strength of working in something that's not human. So right. <laughs> that you exactly. can actually do experiments that manipulate these types of things. Can you tell me when exactly you realized how your research on the fruit fly would overturn preconceived notions about uh, sexual selection? You know, I've been working on fruit flies for 14 years, 16 years, a long time, <laughs> for a long time now. And um, I've probably had uh, two what I would consider sort of controversial results um, in my career. And the first one happened very, very early. Um, one of the, the things that I study in my research is um, looking at the sort of the genetic consequences of having two sexes. Because as I said, you know, regularly we see males you know, perform this courtship routine and females don't do that. And if you look at, um, again, the averages of behaviors or traits for males and females, there tends to be a difference. And what we see a lot in a population is the traits and behaviors that would make the best male in terms of able to produce the most offspring. And that's how we measure fitness in animals is their reproductive success. The traits that make a male that have the highest reproductive success are not the same as the ones that make a female with the higher, highest reproductive success. Just because the strategies that a male needs to use to fertilize eggs are different than the strategies that a female needs to use to obtain those fertilizations. So what can end up happening is genetic variation that would be really beneficial in a strong, like a very male background might not be beneficial in a female background and could actually be costly. And this was one of the, the very first projects that I worked on uh, when I was a master's student. And um, uh, I, I had been brought up in this culture of studying how what we call sexually antagonistic genetic variation, how it can have different effects on reproductive success in the two sexes. So I didn't really have a real understanding of how potentially controversial this was. And one of my main results was that as a consequence of this, a female who mates with one of the highest quality males in terms of his reproductive success has very low quality offspring. And this is, a, I see people who are familiar with biology <sighs> looking very confused in the audience. <sighs> and this was the reaction that was met by many of my colleagues. And I was very, very young in research. I wasn't much older than <sighs> Barnard undergraduates. And I, I got very aggressive um, pushback from my reviewers, and um, when the paper came out, it got a lot of press. And that was sort of when I realized, you know, what the, the popular press is really interested in isn't always what the scientific community is very interested in, but it was sort of when I realized that this might be more of a controversial result than I they intended. And, and the, the reasons for this are just that when we think about why females are choosing a partner, one of the most commonly invoked arguments is that they get better quality offspring. The female who mates with the, the best male, the best male in the population gets the best offspring. And to show that that's not always the case means that then we still don't know why females, what females want, what they're choosing. <laughs> um, and I think when I really realized that it was having a sort of a ripple effect in the scientific community was really not for a few more years. Because this is a study that I had shown in a lab population of fruit flies. And it was a real result. It was a strong experiment. But that doesn't mean that this phenomenon happens in the real world outside of my lab. And it wasn't for a few years when we started to see the exact same pattern replicated in lizards, in other insect species, in sheep, in deer, you know, mammals, birds, vertebrates. Once we started to see the same pattern occurring, that's when I realized, when I, when I appreciated how much of a general effect research in the lab on fruit flies could have because we can study the same principles 
that exist in other more charismatic animals that are maybe more difficult. To, it's difficult to bring a bunch of deer into the lab and look at their, their offspring um, across generations, but this is something that's really feasible to do in the lab. And I think that was for me, you know, like the, the paper coming out in the press was exciting, but really it's sort of the, the quiet afterwards when you feel like this is a, a robust result that will have an impact on the scientific community, when you see it replicated by other scientists in other systems. Can I just respond up? to this and follow up? <laughs> so what, what I love about this story is it shows how changing the frame initially from the traditional frame and, and shifting a little bit to think about, OK, they're both choosing, and what happens when females choose these particular males. You came up with a finding that is deeply challenging to a lot of what people felt was really settled theory in terms about why sexual selection operates the way it does and what it, how it functions. And to me, that's the great fun of bringing these kinds of observations to science, that you can do empirical work that undermines theories, but you can only do that if you have a little bit of a wedge in one of the previous theories to begin with. If everybody is all locked down, always just kind of answering the same thing, the room for movement is quite small. And so there are these moments that have happened when in the last few decades, there's been a lot of, of um, challenge to some of the very um, seemingly settled thinking about the way reproduction works. Um, and we talked, for example, about the classic Bateman studies that are taken as, so this is a, these are studies from the mid 20th century, again on fruit flies, that were used to establish the principle of um, greater male variability in reproductive success. And then that later, in other words, that um, it's because reproduction is so much more costly for females that males, um, uh, males are able to sort of physically and energetically expend much less resource and, and can be either wildly successful or completely unsuccessful. It turns out that there are many, many things about these classic experiments that were wrong including the way he grouped his data to analyze it, even in his own original data, the reproductive success was as variable in females as in males and so on. But this theory is still underpinning a ton of work. The critique of the theory hasn't totally caught up. And so I'm interested in how these shifts, like, oh, females are also choosy in the animal kingdom. Oh, promiscuity is more of the norm than the exception and, and isn't just the domain of males. So to me, this is just super exciting and fun. Do you think, between the two of you, that it's kind of easier to push knowledge in a hard science where the experiment is set up and regulated and you get the results and it's versus in a more kind of interdisciplinary realm where you're relying on environment, culture, you know, all kinds of other things? What do you think? I think I'm very glad I work with fruit flies <laughs> in the lab. <laughs> and I don't have to make <laughs> inferences about, I, I mean, I think, I think it's more complicated when, you know, I have very deliberately avoided applying my research to human populations and going from that. I think that there's a lot of interdisciplinary work that happens in the lab. And I think that that's very powerful and can drive research. But I think when you move outside of, um, you know, I mean, I work in an invertebrate. When you move up sort of into vertebrates and then when you start working with humans, I think it gets a lot more complicated. I think that the stakes are also higher. I think if I, um, you know, publish something in Fruit Flies that turns out to be disproven, I'm not affecting the health of people who are taking that advice. I'm not affecting mm -hmm. laws that are being enacted based on that. So I think the challenges are just, are just different. I mean, mm -hmm. I think you know, the data, it's easier for me to acquire data because I can run an experiment in a few mm -hmm. months in the lab, but I think I'm, I'm, not, I'm not envious of people who are trying to answer these questions in human populations. I would agree with your statement that the challenges are different, mm -hmm. and I think that's probably where I'd land. I mean, 
We're both working in worlds where we're trying to be evidence-driven and are affected by the, the conceptual frames and the language and the prior evidence in, in our fields and in our lives. And so, you know, it's not the case that lab-based research is free of the strictures of how we think, especially lab-based research on the sexes, where we bring in a whole lot of baggage, you know, witness the many years of not noticing the fundamental errors in these classic experiments. You can repeat that in many other places. But the great thing is um, being attached to particular methods does set some rules for, uh, and there are ways in which hopefully course correction um, has at least uh, a, a template that you know that there's some ways that, that you are supposed to invite criticism. And uh, I envy that in the, in the natural sciences because we don't have that same kind of template. And very often um, uh, people get, uh, uh, people think that we are are trying to sort of overturn reality with the critiques that we make within science when I've, that's very much not the case. Interesting. I mean, talking about course correction, you've suggested in some of your research that um, moving away from one mistake, which is basically treating males as the norm, to replacing it with the notion of treating males and females as distinct entities is just a, another mistake. Can you comment a little bit on that? Yeah, I made that comment um, in the context of some new NIH rules that um, the National Institutes of Health that mandated um, that males and females and male and female tissue, male and female material be used in all, uh, in all research, including very basic research. And that in and of itself is not fundamentally problematic because there were ways that people could say, like make an exemption for a particular research question that had to be one or the other. The problem that I saw and that many other people saw was that it, that mandate came with a whole articulated program that prioritized the investigation of sex differences over explicitly sex differences, over similarities or over mechanisms. And so, what, um, what I think the problem is, is that very often there, there is too much research out there that is just focused on establishing and, and extending the list of sex differences without actually um, nearly enough attention to mechanisms and to the ways in which, you know, differences in outcomes are not always achieved by differences in inputs. And, and part, by focusing and prioritizing different outcomes in the sexes, we lose a lot of opportunity for understanding sort of um, the, the functions and the developmental trajectories that uh, are connected to sex-linked biology. And in particular, it can cement the idea that a finding of difference is stable and static when much of what we know is many, many, many findings of difference hold for particular contexts and circumstances and experimental conditions. And if we focused much more on understanding those connections between the conditions, the environment, and the expression of a phenotype of difference, then that that focus would draw us to mechanisms and I think in the end would be a lot more useful. Just thinking about the binary, um, what, what value, if any, remains in treating the binary male, female in your various research endeavors? Working in fruit flies, I feel like that is, we're limited in how we can classify them. That is a fundamental difference that we can use where we can look at the genitalia and assign them into males and females. And I think that that is, at least in a species that 
as far as I know, does not have a gender identity that it can communicate to me. I think that that's the best place to start. And I think that it, it's, a, it's a, a great starting point for our scientific investigation is to look at males and females, but I think we have to be careful not to fall into this trap of saying, okay, this is, this is what a male does. This is how a male looks. This is how a male acts. This is what a female does, how a female smells, how a female acts, and to remember that even within these categories that there is so much variation in that. And I think that that's something that, that we just sort of, as humans, like to have rules about how the world works. Okay, males do this, females do that. Um, you know, boys like trucks, girls like dolls, things like that. And then these, these rules are not necessarily reflective of all of the variation of population. So for me, I mean, starting with the sexes and treating them as a separate environment is a great place to begin my research, but then recognizing that I can have genotypes in which the males behave differently from how I might characterize a male, and instead of discounting that data, investigating it and trying to figure out what these males might be doing, what these behaviors might be, how they might be different from the, the masculine norm, I think there's a lot of value in that instead of just saying, oh, those, mm -hmm. those are the, the weird males. They're not behaving according to my preconceived male ideals mm -hmm. <laughs> in the lab. You're looking at internal variation in ways that, and I think that's, that's so crucial. In my work, I'd say that, um, you know, my job, my goal a lot of times is uh, to be, um, to, to counter the received wisdom, the naturalized way of thinking about sex and gender and how they're attached. So um, I'm, much more interested in thinking about ways that um, we can dissolve habitual binary thinking. Because I think there, there are plenty of people working hard to preserve that. I'm not, <laughs> I, don't, I don't feel very invested in, in helping them out. Um, so instead, there's an enorm, there's not just enormous pressure. I think it's important to recognize, you know, that Gender is a political structure. It's a power structure that is enforced. The expectations have real consequences. And that, um, that pushing against binary expectations uh, is something that comes with both political costs and I hope often, in the long run, at least political advantages and gains. And so. You know, I'm thinking about this in different levels, in different domains. So for me, I'm, I will not take your bait. I will not push the binary. <laughs> OK, I try. You try. <laughs> Professor Jordan Young, your research is uh, very interesting in that you bring a kind of critical theory lens to what is traditional scientific research, social, and, and, and your own views and research around social and cultural beliefs about gender and sex. And how, taking a larger view of the thing, how, have this, how has this critical theory lens sort of impacted scientific research and how has scientific research impacted your own view? There is right now a project of documentation of how, um, critical theory, in particular critical feminist analyses of science, have actually made positive contributions to scientific knowledge and method. Um, I'll say that even the notion of, like, of um, uh, female promiscuity as a domain of analysis came from women scientists being able to enter experimental fields and, and notice things. I mean, there's, there's fantastic documentation of um, the revisions of primate behavior that came from women, and in particular, feminist primatologists. And, so, and we could look at the whole history of the women's health movement and the revision of the way um, uh, medicine is, is practiced and understood. I mean, there are many, 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 many gains that um, have happened both in the way scientific ideas are structured in, in just the uh, core principles of development in certain ways, but also in who's doing science. And those things are related to each other. What I think 
you know, in terms of theory and the critical theory um, is no good if it doesn't actually relate to the real world. So for me, the most compelling examples in critical theory come from thinking about bodies and the ways that bodies actually defy ideological expectations about sex and gender. I ideologies and politics are where you find the binary and this very sharp dichotomy. Bodies don't behave in that same way. Bodies are much more variable and interesting. So for me, thinking from bodies is the source of incredible theory, and it's the test of theory. If theory can't actually accommodate bodies, it's no good. So turning to you, because you don't get out unscathed either. <laughs> Um, I have to say that I have uh, heard that you, in public talks, you have provocatively um, suggested that your research on fruit, fruit flies can tell us something about male fighting elephants and uh, the men on MTV's Jersey Shore. <laughs> so I'm, cu I'm curious about how. About how. Huh. Um, so, you know, just to, to back up a bit so it doesn't sound like I'm <laughs> overstating. Um, <laughs> One of the things, so, you know, I, I, I really like fruit flies. <laughs> you know, this is what I built my, my, my research program around. But I, I also recognize that maybe not everybody is that into fruit flies. And if I said, come hear me talk about fruit flies, that you might not be able to fill a room. <laughs> but one of the things that I try to do when I'm speaking to broader audiences is really put it in concepts that they can relate to. So I feel like you know, a lot of people can relate to the fighting elephants, for example. Males fighting with one another for dominance, they fight to have control over a female, things like that. The same thing, the example I used before of the bird of paradise. A lot of the times when I talk my, start my talks, I don't start by talking about fruit flies because that's not the hook to get people into my research unless they're already on the fruit fly train. <laughs> um, and uh, so I talk about these charismatic animals, elephants, beautiful birds. That, that particular example was when I was talking about, um, as, a, as a humor, humorous introduction, as a, an example of traits that males use to attract females. And it was a picture of the situation from the Jersey Shore at an award show in a tank top, holding it up and pointing at his abs. And it was just something that was meant to be you know, something relatable to an audience. Uh, <laughs> but what I try to do is I start by saying, okay, you know, there are these sort of traits in the animal kingdom, and sometimes they're a little ridiculous when you look at them in um, human populations. Uh, but fruit flies, and then I sort of segue into fruit flies and how they're just like any other animal. And one of the things we see regularly is that just like the elephants fighting for territory, if there's sort of a, a really high quality patch of rotting fruit, these males will sort of attract to it and then do these sumo wrestling battles to try and defend this rotting fruit territory because that's what attracts the females. So just like the elephants fighting, the fruit flies fight. And then just like a bird of paradise performing this, having this elaborate coloring and performing this, this courtship song for mates, fruit flies are maybe not as beautiful to look at, but the males will perform this courtship dance where they'll run around the females and stick out their wings, which reflect a lot of interesting light, and they will actually vibrate their wing back and forth to produce what we call a song. So they're serenading the female. So one of the, the reasons that I try to use this is to just emphasize that even though it's this maybe not that interesting animal to look at on the surface, it is an animal. It has all of these, the same suite of behaviors and traits that we see in more charismatic animals just in a species that's easy to control and study in the lab. So I try to branch out and then make the fruit fly analogy. <laughs> what would you like most for people to take out of your research? And I'll start with you this time. Oh, wow. Wow, what would I like people to most take out yeah. of my research? Yeah. What are the sort of key takeaways of your research? One of them, I think, is that um, females have more control over their reproductive output than they had previously been attributed. Um, I think that, you know, we had thought about, you were sort of talking about this example of like females just, okay, this male's courting me, that's the male I'm going to take, but there's 
um, a lot of rejection behaviors that females elicit. They regularly re reject courting males. And I think the other thing is that when females are promiscuous, this isn't just like a lifestyle choice. There's a purpose for this. Females are mating with males purposefully to control who, whose sperm they have on board or who they might use to, uh, to father their offspring. This is some control that females have over um, the, the genetic quality of their offspring. And I guess the other thing that I would want to, um, people to take from my research is that fruit flies are awesome. <laughs> that, you know, you can, that even if you're not studying, people study uh, behavior and evolution and genetics in a number of different organisms. And I think it's really easy when you're new to biology or you're new to science to focus on, oh, why, you know, one of the questions I get, why don't you work with elephants? Why don't you work with you know, primates? Why don't you work with X? And I think one of the things that I, I try to emphasize is that those are wonderful systems to work in, but every system has its own advantages and limitations. And one of the strong advantages of working in a system like fruit flies is that because there are these sort of universal similarities across the animal world, you can study the same principles and behaviors and traits that exist in these larger animals in something that has a whole generation in two weeks in the lab that can have hundreds of offspring that you can easily assign paternity to. And I think that there's a lot of value in maybe working with the, the, the ugly duglickings of the animal world. Well, on behalf of Barnard College, I'm glad you don't work with elephants. <laughs> <laughs> it would be difficult to fit them all in my yes, lab in Ultra, would. I'm just saying. <laughs> what I want people most to take away, I think, is that um, the domain of sex and gender is not just handed down by nature, but is a social, it's a set of social structures and power relations, and that set of, of social structures and power relations seeps into laboratory work or any kind of scientific work, that it takes extra hard work to do research on sex and gender because it is so saturated with, um, with politics and with expectation. And everybody here is an expert of sorts on sex and gender. And we're not taught routinely, unless you happen to be in the Department of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies, to question that expertise and to learn systematic ways of evaluating that knowledge and understanding. And so I want to first make a plea for doing that examination and to also then say that feminist engagements or, or critical gender engagements with science are in no way meant to say, science, see, science is no good, it's all politics. That's not at all the point. The point is that, um, that it's hard work and that you need to add critical analysis of sex and gender to the methodological toolkit in order to do really good science. And that when we do that, there's power in that that's going to not just advance science more, but reverberate back out to shake what we think we know about nature. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you again, everybody. You've been a wonderful audience. And have a good evening.